Hi everyone, we're here to read the next section of Zoe in Wonderland by Brenda Woods for the Gilbert Library's Winter Reading. Here we go. Chapter 31, Christmas and the Day After. For the first time ever, I could hardly wait for Christmas Day to be over. Quincy was coming tomorrow and staying at our house for the whole week. Besides, Christmas was becoming like a book I'd practically memorized, but I reread over and over again because I liked it so much. Year after year after year. Get up in the morning, wish everyone Merry Christmas, put on nice clothes, go to church, come home, open presents, say you like it even if you don't, help cook dinner, eat dinner from the fancy plates, help clean up the huge Christmas mess. We had just finished putting the house back to, to pre-Christmas normal when suddenly the front door flew open. Daddy bounced up from the sofa, went to the door, and peered outside. Just the wind, he said. Santa Anna's are kicking up again. Toasty outside, too, Grandpa Reindeer added. Grandpa was right. For December, it was pretty hot. Outside, the wind howled. The next day, Jade left to spend a few days with her friend Tori, whose friend had a cabin in the mountains. So she wasn't with us when we went to pick up Quincy from the airport. Howdy do, Mr. Quincy, Daddy asked. He grinned. Hey, you guys. I was thinking we should take advantage of this warm weather and head to the beach. Your mom packed some towels and things. That sound good? Daddy asked as he pulled out into traffic. Harper hollered, yay! Sounds awesome, Quincy replied. But I asked, what about the Wonderland? Who's going to work in the nursery? I closed it for the day. Day after Christmas is always slow anyway, Daddy answered. Can we eat lunch at the beach too, Harper asked. Daddy nodded, and before long, we were driving slowly down the narrow street that led to Paradise Cove. We came here last summer with Wes. They have the best onion rings, I told him. But it's kind of expensive, Quincy warned. Daddy chuckled. Not to worry. We're here to have a good time. But as soon as we'd parked, Daddy discovered he'd forgotten his cell phone and started fussing. What if Jade calls? Mom waved her cell phone in his face. I have mine, Darrow. Daddy relaxed, squeezing her hand, and we headed into the restaurant, where they took our name and gave us a red lobster thing that would buzz when our table was ready. Reindeer. Is that a joke? The man taking names asked my daddy. Not a joke, Daddy informed him. The man apologized. Sorry, sir. Not a problem, Daddy told him. Because the man had said the wait for the table for five would be long, we went out the back way and walked to the water's edge. I slipped off my shoes, tied them together, and slung them over my shoulder. I love the beach. Wading in the blue water, watching the sunset, seagulls squawking, the way everyone seems happy. I want to live at the beach. Can we please live at the beach, I pleaded. In your dreams, Mom answered. When I grow up, I'm going to live at the beach, for real, I told her, then ran to join Quincy where he and Harper had already planted themselves on the sand. Why are you sitting down? I asked Quincy. We're at the beach. Let's go. I reached for his hand, pulled him to his feet, and we waded into the water until it was almost to our knees. The tide rolled out, trying to suck us with it. I wiggled my toes in the wet sand and shielded my eyes from the sun glinting on the water. Some kids with boogie boards paddled out, trying to catch a wave. Quincy and I stepped out of the cold water and walked onto the warm sand. Every so often, the waves rolled in, licking at our feet. A frisbee flew by, just missing me. How's your friend? Quincy asked. Adam? Yeah, him. I told Quincy about the boy who called me not ugly and that mostly we ate lunch together. He's gone to Paris for vacation, but he's coming back before school starts again, I said. Right then, I wondered if Quincy was making friends too. He hadn't mentioned anything. Did you get any new friends yet? I asked. Sorta. Of. There's this kid named Simon who lives in the apartment next door and goes to my school. Sometimes when he doesn't have band practice, we walk home together. He plays the trumpet and he's pretty good, except at night when I'm trying to sleep and he's practicing. I wish he played a quieter instrument. Like a guitar, I said, but not electric. Quincy smiled. Definitely not electric. That is gruesome. And some other kids at school are kind of cool with me, but I haven't, like, gone to their houses or anything. Although I wanted Quincy to make friends, I wanted to stay his best friend forever. But I'm still your best friend, right? You know it, and I'm still yours? I nudged him with my shoulder. Forever and ever. Quincy grinned. 
All of a sudden, I thought about Kendra. How's your mom? All better? Mostly. She still gets tired sometimes. I've been helping her get organized, as she calls it, and on weekends we kind of explore around, mostly on the BART train. Did you ride a trolley car yet? Quincy nodded. And once my mom is a little stronger, we're going to go to the Golden Gate Bridge walk. My dad already jogged across it to Sausalito and back a couple of times. Zoe, wearing shorts and running shoes, stood on the Golden Gate Bridge, peering out at the horizon. A group of joggers motioned for Zoe to join them. It was a beautiful day in San Francisco. Zoe joined the herd of runners and soon led the pack. Right then, someone tugged so hard on my t-shirt that I almost fell backwards. It was Harper. Come on, our table's ready. We ordered a bunch of food, ate it all, including dessert, then headed back to the beach. Together, we trailed along, past the big rocks to the tide pools. The red-orange sun was almost down when the reindeer parents decided it was time to go. Can we please just watch the sun until it disappears, I begged. I like the way it looks. Quincy snapped a photo. Me too. Okay, but after that, we need to go, Mom told us. Battery on my cell just died, and I forgot my car charger. So as soon as the sun left, we did too. On the ride home, Harper stared silently out the window, his forehead pressed to the glass. Soft music from the radio played, and Mom hummed along. I glanced over at Quincy. He had nodded off. The freeway was backed up, and traffic was very slow. I was almost glad it was taking a long time. This had been my, one of my best days ever, and I really didn't want it to be over. Chapter 32, Wind and Tears The closer we got to Pasadena, the stronger the Santa Ana winds got. We were getting near the Wonderland when the air turned smoky. Ashes floated down on the car's hood and front window, reminding me of snowflakes. Must have been a fire, Daddy said. Wind and heat, recipe for a blaze. And then we turned the corny corner, and Daddy skidded to a stop. Fire trucks were everywhere, lining our street. One long red fire truck blocked the road, preventing us from going any further. A guy in a red SUV that said Fire Captain on the door waved us to the side of the road. Daddy pulled over and rolled down the window. What happened? A few houses burned down to the ground. That Wonderland plant place, too. It's mostly gone. From what we can put together, it started from some candles the old lady was burning. They found her outside her house with the hose, trying to put the fire out. With these winds, it's lucky we stopped it before it did any more damage. Shame, right after Christmas. You live around here? Daddy put his head down on the steering wheel. Mom gasped and started to cry. Harper yelled, No way! I turned to Quincy. Huh? was the only sound I could make. After that, so many things happened that it was hard to keep track because the people from the fire department wouldn't even let us get anywhere close to the Wonderland that night, we headed to Grandpa and Nana's apartment. Grandpa opened the door. His face had a bad look, a look like he'd just swallowed vinegar. It's all gone, my whole life. Daddy fell to his father's arms and cried. I don't think I'd ever seen my daddy cry before. I grabbed his hand. Went over there as soon as we heard it on the news, but they wouldn't let us near. Sorry I had to find out like that, Daryl. Couldn't get you on your cell phones, Grandpa told him. Daddy sobbed quietly, and Nana and Grandpa Reindeer embraced their only son. It's my fault, I confessed to Quincy later that night, as we stared up at the dark ceiling from sleeping bags on Nana and Grandpa's floor. He nudged me with his arm. You weren't even there. But she started a fire before, and I should have told someone. But Mrs. Warner begged me not to because she was afraid they'd put her in an old people orphanage. And now her house is gone and ours is too. I should have told, I sniveled. It's not your fault, Zoe, really. It's just an accident. But he tried hard to convince me. Even if you had told, it probably still would have happened. I swear it's not your fault, he repeated. I wanted to believe him, but I couldn't. I tossed around all night, barely sleeping. My eyes were wide open when the sun came up. I smelled bacon cooking. I didn't want to be hungry, but I was. Chapter 33, The Wonderland's Ashes. You would have thought that because the Wonderland had so many amazing things that its ashes would have been special, but they weren't. They were the same as fireplace ashes or the ashes in the barbecue pit, just plain old gray ashes. 
together, the reindeer family, except for Jade, who is still on the mountains, staggered around through the Wonderland, hoping something hadn't been eaten by the flames, but it seemed like everything had. Daddy and Mom's faces were as gray as the ashes. Every tree and plant had been burned to a crisp. The nursery was burned to the ground, and the place where our house had been was charred black. Quincy and I headed to what was left of the greenhouse. Only one part was still there, but from what I could see, none of the plants had survived. When I glanced over to where I'd planted the baobabs, the old coffee cans didn't look like they'd been touched by the fire. I went over and examined the cans one by one. Quincy! I screamed. He ran to my side. Are you dying? Because that was an I am dying scream. I held up one of the cans for him to see. It was the old, rusty, Kona Hawaiian coffee can. One of them finally grew a baobab. We looked at the bright green stem and two perfectly sprouted leaves. Wow, he declared and snapped the picture. I didn't think about anything after that. My feet took over and I ran. I had to show Daddy. I found him standing where the nursery used to be. Daddy, I yelled. What's wrong, Zoe? I held up the can for him to see. It grew a baobab. It was a secret and I was hoping it would grow by Christmas so I could give it to you for a present, but it didn't. It's a baobab and it's endangered and it's special and it's the only thing that didn't get burned up. Merry Christmas. Daddy took it from my hand and studied the can and the seedling. It's a sign, he said. It has to be a sign. And that's where we're going to stop for today. Keep an eye out for the last section. Okay, bye.